Hello, I'm Rob Lawrence and I'm the Chairman of Communications for the American Ambulance Association and I'm delighted to be able to introduce this video to you today. Coming up we have four fantastic speakers who are going to impart their professional knowledge on how to improve your presence in a virtual presentation or indeed a webinar. In the lineup today we have Boris Krotenog and Boris is the Chief Executive and President of Amwest Ambulance of North Hollywood. Boris not only is the Amulet Service CEO, but is also a Hollywood TV and movie character actor. Also, we have Alexia Jobson, and Alexia is the Public Affairs Manager for Remsa of Reno, Nevada. And in her past, she was also a PR media communications expert. Also joining us is James DiClemente, and James is the Director of Prodigy EMS, the Online Learning Management System and also the Director of Education of Pro EMS of Cambridge, Massachusetts. First up, I'm delighted to introduce Mark Tenure, and Mark is the PR Manager for the Richmond Ambulance Authority in Richmond, Virginia. Before joining RAA, Mark was a TV news reporter and anchor. So, over to you, Mark. Hello, everyone. My name is Mark Tenya. I am the Public Relations Meeting Manager at the Richmond Ambulance Authority in Richmond, Virginia. I've been doing this job for about two years, but prior to this position, I was actually a television reporter and fill and anchor for more than 10 years. As we continue to go around the area, we continue to see just how devastating this storm actually is. It was last year when the Rams made that magical run to the Final Four, and today they're headed back to the big dance. Turning down to our top story, VCU's NCAA tournament run came to an end last night. Right here last night, we went to speak to one of the people that was hit who recorded the entire interaction with that woman on his cell phone. So I have a lot of experience on camera, some good, some not so good. And hopefully what we talk about today will help you avoid some of the pitfalls that I ran into, as well as some of the things that helped make me successful during my broadcast career. Now, I know a lot of you have a lot of experience talking in front of an audience. And some of you may even depend on that instant reaction and interaction from the audience to know whether or not what you're saying is engaging and whether or not the audience is receptive to what you're saying. It's obviously a lot different when you're talking to a camera because you don't have that instant feedback. But hopefully after we talk today, you feel a little bit more comfortable and confident in front of the camera. Now I've broken up today's presentation into three different sections. While there are plenty of things I can tell you about being in front of the camera, these are the three things I think you need to concentrate on the most in order to improve your on-camera presence. So let's go ahead and dive right in. The first is practice. Practice really does make perfect. And while there are many differences between speaking in front of a crowd and speaking in front of a camera, some of the principles are the same. So what would you tell someone that is about to give a speech in front of a crowd for the first time? You would tell them to practice. You may even tell them to practice in the space where they're going to be delivering their message. The same goes for someone that may not be that comfortable in front of the camera. Go ahead and practice in the space, the space being the camera in this situation. So go ahead, grab your cell phone and start recording yourself. And I wouldn't record an entire presentation. Start with 30 second and one minute clips just to get an idea of what you look like and what you sound like on camera. And I'll tell you why I think this is so important with a short story. When I was a kid, I had no problem speaking in front of a crowd, speaking in front of my class, so much so that my teacher actually called my parents and said, I think you should enter your child into an oratorical contest. I ended up entering that contest and placing. I had no problem speaking in my public speaking classes in college, got good grades, so I thought I would have no problem speaking in front of a camera. It wasn't until I started getting into television and recorded myself for the first time that I realized I was not comfortable in front of the camera and became a completely different person than I was when I was speaking in front of a crowd. I was unenergetic, unenthusiastic, and I was so monotone and uninteresting. It took me a long time because I wanted to become a reporter to learn how to speak in front of the camera and have the same persona that I had in front of people in front of the lens. And that only came through practice and doing it over and over again until I became more comfortable in front of the camera. And that brings me to my next point, which is evaluating the recording. Look at yourself. Some of us are very good at self-evaluation. We can tell where we've done well and where we need to improve. And some of us are way too hard on ourselves, which can be detrimental to your improvement. Because the next time you get in front of the camera, you're thinking about how horribly you think you did last time, which makes the current recording not good. And then it just becomes this repeating cycle. So get out of your head, know that you're going to make mistakes, and know that that's okay. 
because you're just going to keep practicing and trying and slowly you will see that improvement and that will only help you build confidence. And whether you're good at self-evaluation or not, I would also ask someone that you know and trust to give you their feedback on how you sound and look on camera. That input will only help you improve long term. You also may have to figure out what works best for you and what looks the best. Right now, I'm sitting down, but I could just as easily be giving this presentation while standing up, which brings us to our next section, which is performance. These are some of the things that you can think about and try as you're practicing and recording yourself. Now, I personally prefer standing over sitting down. I think I'm more comfortable. I think I sound better, but I can do both. You're going to want to practice sitting down and standing up and seeing what works best for you. And also keep in mind that depending on the presentation, you may have to sit in some parts and stand in others. Just determine what works best for you, where you sound best, where you're most comfortable, and what looks the best, depending on what you're presenting. Another thing to think about and try as you're crafting your on-camera presence is pretending the camera is a person. Now that's a popular and common piece of advice. Obviously when you're presenting to a camera, it's not the same as presenting to an actual human being. But this again goes back to why it's so important to practice because the more you practice in front of the camera and the more that you talk to a camera, the more you can envision the camera actually being a person. And the reason you're told to talk to the camera like it's a person is because you want to be more conversational. You actually want to act like you're talking to an audience because you are. And it's amazing the difference you'll see in your performance when you can actually act like the camera is a person as opposed to this inanimate object. Now, as you practice and get more comfortable in front of the camera and can actually act like you're speaking to a person, you're also going to want to work on the message and presentation that you're delivering, making sure that it's clear, concise, and delivered with confidence. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the easiest way is making sure you're knowledgeable about what you're talking about and having a plan about how you're going to deliver that message before you get in front of the camera. So think about your presentation and each bullet point as a story that has a beginning, middle, and end. It's gonna make it easier for you to get into that intro, deliver your message without rambling on, and wrapping everything up so you can go on to the next point. Which brings me to my next point, which is being enthusiastic and showing energy. Now, if you remember when I was speaking earlier on, I said the first time that I recorded myself, I was very monotone and unenthusiastic. So I was told to show more energy and enthusiasm as I recorded myself, and I equated more enthusiasm and energy with an increase in my volume and more movement of my body. But that does not equate to enthusiasm and energy. I'll give you a quick example. My name is Mark Tenya, and I am from the Richmond Ambulance Authority. Not very enthusiastic, not very energetic. Here's the same line given with a little more enthusiasm and energy, but at the same volume. My name is Mark Tenya, and I'm from the Richmond Ambulance Authority. I wasn't any louder, but it was more enthusiastic and had more energy, and I just made small adjustments. I don't know if you noticed this or not, but I like to speak with my hands. When I'm speaking to a person, I normally am using my hands. You don't need to go flailing all over the place, but as you're talking, go ahead and talk like you're talking to a person. So if you do use your hands as you're speaking, it's actually gonna help you as you're giving your presentation. Well, what else can you try? I stressed some words more than others, so as you're presenting, think about some of the words that you can stress over other words, and it will actually help as you're presenting. And I also make sure that I don't go too fast or too slow. Which brings me to my next point, which is pace. You want to make sure that you find a good pace for yourself as you're presenting in front of the camera. You don't want to go too fast because the audience is going to have a hard time following you. You also don't want to go too slow because that can also come across as unenergetic and unenthusiastic. Now, as you try all these different things, this will help you find your voice, which brings me to my next point, which is finding your voice. You don't want to look at somebody that you think is a great speaker and try to copy their style because what works for them may not necessarily work for you. And again, this goes back to practice. You're gonna to wanna to try all these different things and find out what works and sounds and looks the best when it comes to you. One of the best pieces of advice that I was given as I was trying to improve my on-camera presence was not trying to copy someone else, but figuring out what worked best for me. Now, so far in this presentation, we've talked about the importance of practice. We've talked about things you can do and try as you practice, but just as important as those two things is thinking about where you're gonna practice and what steps you're gonna to take to make sure it looks good. Our next section is presentation, and I'm not necessarily getting into the presentation that you're gonna be giving, but more of the setting, the equipment that you're gonna be using, what you're gonna be doing to make sure that the video and the on-camera presence looks as good as possible. 
Now, at the beginning of this presentation, I started at my desk in my office because I imagine many of you will be delivering your presentations and practicing in this environment. I then moved the presentation to myself standing and made sure that I had a background that was interesting. It wasn't just a plain white wall. It also showed our website and where I'm from. These are some of the things that you're going to want to think about as you're delivering your presentation. How does this look? to the audience. Another thing you're going to have to think about is what kind of equipment do you want to use? Are you going to use the camera from your laptop? Are you going to use the camera from your cell phone? Are you going to have one cell phone or two cell phones? Are you going to invest in a tripod? Are you going to invest in lights? Now if you go back to the beginning of my presentation, you'll see that I'm sitting at my desk. What you may not realize is all the setup that I did prior to actually hitting the record button. You can see that I have the laptop sitting on top of a box. I have a light set up. And if you look at where I'm standing right now, I'm actually using two cameras, two tripods and a light with my presentation in the background. And this entire presentation was shot with a wireless mic. So the audio quality is actually a lot better than it would be if it were just a camera. Now I'm not saying you need to invest in all of this equipment to make your presentation dynamic. But there are some small investments that you can make that will improve the appearance of your on-camera presentation. You can find some fairly cheap tripods for your cell phone as well as lights online or at a local electronics store. If you decide not to invest in tripods or lights or a microphone, that's okay. Just make sure that you're shooting in a well-lit area and make sure that the source of the light is coming at you. The last thing you want to do is shoot in front of a window with sunlight or lights coming from behind you as opposed to shining on you. That will make a huge difference in making sure that the clips that you shoot look a lot better. And the reason that I had the laptop on the box at the beginning of this presentation is because you want to try and shoot at eye level. That's also going to make a world of difference and make you look better in front of the camera. And as you're giving a presentation in front of the camera, make sure that you're definitely coming back and making eye contact with the camera. You don't have to do it the entire time, but it's just as if you were speaking to an audience. You want to make sure that you're making eye contact with the audience, and the audience in this case is the camera. Well, that's going to do it for my presentation. I just want to thank all of you for taking the time to listen to what I had to say today. This is my contact information. Feel free to call me or email me if you have any questions, would like more advice, or even if you'd like some feedback on any of your clips. I'd also like to thank the American Ambulance Association for giving me this opportunity to speak to all of you. Thank you. Hi, this is Boris Krutanak. I'd like to share some thoughts on making video presentations at home. See, I believe that authenticity on camera and uh, storytelling elements are key to creating great video presentations. When we watch incredible actors perform, what draws us to them? Why do we like watching them? Well, I believe it's mostly for two reasons. We notice, often subconsciously, their thought process. It helps us identify with what they're going through. And two, the unpredictability of their response, of their next move. See, put the two together and we can watch them forever. The trick is they memorize the script inside out, make it their own, then throw the script away and improvise, which is their way of storytelling. So I want to suggest we use the same technique for creating presentations at home. Script what you're going to say, make it your own, Rehearse it a lot, and then tell it to the camera. A lot of times. <laughs> and by the way, you don't need to look at the camera all the time. You can look away as you ponder a thought, recall a memory, look back at the camera. It's basically like telling a story around the campfire, only with a lot more energy and in less time. Oh, and by the way, you don't need to record it all at once. You can record it in chunks, familiarize with the paragraph, make it yours, record it, move on to the next paragraph, record that, and so on. So, injecting storytelling elements like humor, suspense, pauses for recall or effect will give your presentation freshness and originality. Make it seem like you're creating content as you go, like, like your wheels are turning all the time. Make it authentic or, or make it seem authentic. And most importantly, have fun. Hello, 
I'm Alexia Bradiotis Jobson, Public Affairs Manager at REMSA, a ground and air mobile healthcare provider located in Reno, Nevada. I help prepare subject matter experts of all levels for media interviews, owned digital content pieces, and live presentations. As you prepare to present your subject matter via a virtual platform, I want to share some tips with you about ways I develop content and work with subject matter experts to help them create comfort and familiarity with their information. First, when considering your subject matter, keep your main topic areas to a maximum of three to five points. Next, prepare your presentation well in advance. This gives you time to read through it and edit it, and then to mock up a presentation and edit again. Ensure that the content flows easily and is reflective of the way you talk, present, and connect with an audience. The next thing you want to do is have your colleagues and the subject matter experts review the material. And then ask those same colleagues and subject matter experts to let you practice in front of them. I know practicing can feel silly, but your audience is sharing their time with you. They deserve to get the best, most prepared and polished version of your presentation. Practicing the content allows you to get comfortable with the words and phrases that make an impact, identify missing segues, and determine whether a joke results in crickets or uproarious laughter. Have your mock audience keep track of your presentation by simultaneously reviewing your notes or outline to make sure you cover all of your points. Choose a practice audience that includes people who will give you honest feedback intended to improve your presentation. Have them watch the timing, listen for sentences or thoughts that are incomplete, notice where you get off track, and if there are sections that just aren't working well. My next tip is to record and watch yourself. Hardly anyone likes watching or listening to themselves give a presentation, but it will give you the audience's perspective, allowing you to make critically important adjustments. Finally, make sure you build in enough time to repeat this whole process at least twice. Good luck. My name is James D. Clementi from Prodigy MS, and I'm gonna to talk to you about presenting live webinars, as well as some equipment we can use for both live and pre-recorded webinars to help improve our production value. Mark mentioned some great tips that will work well if you're doing something pre-recorded or you're doing something live. There are a few things to keep in mind when you're doing a live presentation. If you're pre-recording something, you can do multiple takes. You can record that, you can scrap it, you can bring in other pieces. You can really manipulate that to make it look perfect. When you're doing a live webinar, you don't quite have that ability. So one of the things we want to consider is practice and preparation, as Mark talked about. But that preparation piece goes beyond just being ready to present. But what can I have with me in case things don't go well? One of the tips that I would give you is to have your presentation printed out. We know that technology isn't perfect. The video stream might go down on your end. You may lose your presentation, and you don't want to be fumbling around in the middle of a presentation trying to figure out how to make the slides advance. It's also helpful to number your slides. If you do have somebody else controlling that slide deck for you, you can tell them go to slide four. Instead of go to the slide that has a picture of the ambulance that's driving down the street, you can be very clear and concise, and you can help move that presentation forward. You also want to remove any of the fluff from your presentation. You may have some animations in there, and maybe you have some video, you have some audio, and it's not necessarily required for your presentation. It was just add some production value when you were doing it live. Those things will absolutely slow down an online presentation. There's a few things that we see happen, especially with animations. The first is that the person trying to watch that maybe on a slow connection, they're now behind you because their computer is trying to get caught up with these animations. We also see that the presentation that's happening on the screen is delayed from what's happening in the computer. So you hit the next slide, the animation starts, you don't see the slide, you hit it again, now you skip by that slide, now it's just fumbling around trying to get back to where you were. Take out the animations. Video is also something to be cautious about. I know that for some of your presentation that may require video, just know that certain webinar platforms don't handle video very well. It's going to play very choppy, the audio isn't going to come through. In fact, some uh, presentation softwares don't even play the audio when you're playing that video. So just be cautious of that. If there is a video that's required for your presentation, make sure to get on ahead of time and do a practice run to make sure the technology is gonna work well and have a plan in case it doesn't. If something happens with the video, it's not playing right, you need to be prepared to move beyond that, again, instead of trying to fumble around with that presentation. And be prepared to present with other lecturers. If you're doing a webinar with multiple panelists, know exactly who's gonna present which piece. Have one person control the slide deck and just know who's going to do that. Finally, we wanna make sure that all of our equipment is prepared. We may have done hundreds of webinars, we may have tested everything the day before, but we know technology isn't perfect. Get into that webinar room, 
half hour, 45 minutes early, make sure that your camera looks good, make sure your audio is good. Hopefully there's somebody else in there with you that can look and see and hear how you sound and see your camera and make sure everything's good. Make sure your background is all organized and make sure that the equipment is cooperating with you that day. Even if you know that everything works and in the best case scenario, you're gonna be good to go, you need to have a backup plan. What are you gonna do if your microphone goes down? What are you gonna do if your computer isn't working? Do you have some type of secondary device to use? Just be prepared for the worst case scenario and you're gonna have yourself a great online presentation. When it comes to creating a presentation for online use, there is some equipment considerations that we need to make. Here in the Prodigy Studio, I've got multiple cameras on me. I've got multiple microphones, including a lavalier microphone, a boom microphone, studio lighting. I've got a studio backdrop here. Uh, that all helps us produce a video quality that makes it easier for the audience to watch. They can see me well. They can see our presentation. They can hear me well. Those are important when we make these presentations. Now, we don't expect that every Every presenter at home is gonna have a full studio set up, but there's a few things we can do to help improve audio, to help improve video, and to help improve lighting. And we're gonna go over that. I'm gonna mention some specific equipment, but don't feel like you have to buy this equipment. We're not being paid by these manufacturers. These are just things we've tested, things we've used out in the field that work well for us, and pieces of equipment that are just cheap and simple to use. Now, if you have other equipment, if you have a podcast setup that you can use for audio, great. If you've got a nice camera that you can use for video, that's great as well. I'm just gonna discuss some of those other options for those of us that may not have access to more high-end equipment. First is audio. Audio is most important. A lot of audiences will deal with poor video. You can usually go over poor video with some images, some video, some presentation material. But if you don't capture good, clear audio, you've got no presentation. I would recommend here the Deity V-Lav microphone. This is a great lavalier microphone. A lavalier microphone is just one that pins on your shirt. You can hear people well, it picks up your audio quite well. You can move around with it when you do your presentation and you don't fear losing it. The reason I specifically recommend this microphone is because you can use it for a variety of purposes. It actually has a similar end to a headphone jack, so you can get, uh, an extension to put it on your cell phone. You can get an adapter to put it in your iPhone. You can put it in your Android phone. You can plug it into your computer. There are other microphones with this particular type of end, but the V-Lav mic is what's considered a smart lav. So there are different types of headphone connector jacks, and the V-Lav will know which type it's in and it will work. It also has a 15-foot cord, which means I can place it a bit of a distance away from me. I can move around. I'm not tethered to my device when I record. It's just a good all-around microphone. Next, we've got to consider video. If you've got an external camera, great, that's going to work wonderfully for you. If you don't, you've got a very powerful phone right here in your pocket, whether you've got an Android or an Apple phone or a Microsoft phone, the cameras on these are unbelievable. We want to make sure that we put it on some type of holder. You can buy a cheap tripod or you can buy a gorilla pod or just a, a simple tabletop pod, tripod that you can use, and this will help you position your phone correctly. We want to get it at eye level. That's really our goal. We want to be looking directly at our camera. We don't want to be looking down. We don't want to be looking up. It's just awkward for our audience as they use it. So we wanna make sure that we put it at eye level and this might be using a tripod or placing a small uh, tabletop tripod on a stack of books or something like that, but this will give you a much better video experience. And you can get a little cheap phone holder that will go on the end of a tripod. We use this little Manfrotto one. Uh, we like this one in particular. It's nice and robust, it's sturdy. You don't feel like your phone is gonna fall out of it, but it also has a tabletop kickstand that you can put it up and use it uh, in place of something like a webcam. So this is a great option. And you can record right in your camera, record in the highest quality that your camera will record. If you can record 4K, that's great. As that video is being edited, it gives you a lot of flexibility. It will give you a little bit clearer video. Even if you're gonna export that and use it in 1080p, as most of us will on the internet, you can then actually zoom in in camera and give yourself the look of having multiple cameras with only having one available. And it gives you some nice production value in your pocket. There are some third-party apps that you can use. One of them is called Filmic Pro. It's cheap in the app store and it will just give you some better control over your camera settings. So if you're somebody that does still photography and knows how to set an ISO and an aperture, it will give you some of that ability on your phone. Again, very cheap. Finally, we want to consider lighting. 
audio first, then getting a good video setting, then consider our lighting. Natural lighting can be great for us. If we use a window as natural light, we don't want to put that light behind us, but if we put that light next to us, maybe coming at a 45 degree angle, it will be kind of a nice flattering lighting. We don't want to sit directly under lights in a room. We want to try to offset ourselves. It's kind of off-putting if we see lights just coming directly down on us. Don't be afraid to manipulate that lighting as well. If you've got a lighting fixture with multiple bulbs, try taking one or two of those out and seeing how that light changes your video. You can put a lamp next to you. It will add some interest in your frame, but it will also create some light on your face as well. You are the subject. You want to make sure that you're lit well. One of the devices that we use for this is just a small, it's an aperture light. It's an Aperture MC. Uh, it's a great little light. It's about the size of a credit card, a little bit thicker. And not only does it do nice, bright, traditional light, and you can put that up on something to face down at you, it has a magnet on the back. So unlike a traditional light that needs a stand, you could magnet it to something to shine it down on you. But it also does all kinds of different colors. So if you don't need the light in your room, maybe you put that behind you and just have a nice hue of a different color on the background. Again, just to give that video a little bit of interest. And I encourage you to test all of this setup. Get your audio set up. Get some different lighting. Change the lighting around as you take some video shots. It would take you 15 or 20 minutes to do a few test shots and see what looks best. With just a little bit of equipment, a nice microphone, using your cell phone as your camera and a nice tripod with a tripod holder, and some simple lighting, and you can take your production value up quite a bit with just some material that you have around you and some pretty cheap supplies. When it comes to live presentations, we can use all of the same technology as well, including the phone. There are some great apps that you can get for your phone and for your computer that will allow you to use your phone as a webcam. One of the problems with using the built-in webcam on your computer is it's really difficult to get positioned. So you may be able to raise that up, but now you have to put it at such an angle that it makes it difficult to interact with the screen. If you have an external webcam, that's gonna give you an even better video. But your phone, because the camera quality is so high, will give you an excellent video. Two pieces of software that I would recommend, one of which is OBS Studio or OBS Cam for the phone, as well as IV Cam. IV Cam is a little bit cheaper and easier to use, but OBS Cam actually goes with a nice, robust piece of software on your computer that allows you to have full control. And the computer software is actually free. It's just the cell phone software that's a couple of bucks. But you have the full control that you would have over any professional camera over your phone, so you can really dial in that video. Again, it's something you should practice, something you should be comfortable with. Your camera on your computer or your iPad can be that backup camera source, but you'll get a much better image if using your phone as a webcam. So I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I certainly did. And I'd like to thank Mark, James, Boris, and Alexia for their hard work and for their top tips. On behalf of the American Ambulance Association, thank you for watching. <laughs>